This is an introduction to the first project in the Graphics and Photography GCSE course. The first project is based on architecture and it uses photography and design techniques to create images such as these you see in front of you. So these are pieces of student work that were developed within the architecture project. You can see that this student has incorporated photographs they took themselves within the designs but has also used lots of graphic techniques. These block shapes are called vectors. Um, there's strong use of vectors in these and there's also a use of typography. The photographs are from a trip we did to Manchester and they are the students own photographs. You can see they've been turned black and white and blended into the design work. The images on the left hand side are development pieces. The image on the right hand side was the image that the student felt was the strongest piece of design work. This is what we're all leading towards at the end of the project, a series of designs such as this. It's for an exhibition called Manchester Architecture. And that exhibition, we will imagine, takes place at the Home Gallery in Manchester. So you will see on some designs coming up over the next few slides that they say Architecture Home Manchester. That is the text that you will incorporate in these, into your own designs. You won't get to this point straight away. We have to do a series of pieces of work to get to the point where you're ready to start making designs. So that will include taking some photographs, but it will also include looking at a series of photographers and graphic designers. We're going to start doing that today. But before we do that, we'll look at some other examples of student work. We do like this idea that you can lead the project in a way that you, you like. So if you're more interested in photography, you would make the designs very photography uh, biased. If you're more interested in the design concepts, then obviously you will concentrate more on colour schemes, vectors and typography. This one is very photography led. You can see Manchester architecture at home on the designs. And again, it's got this idea, development pieces on the left and a more final piece on the right hand side. And again, it is totally driven by the student's own photographs. Another one that's very photography driven in theory, but when you look closer, you can see there's a lot of use of vectors. This student is quite interested in the idea of almost logo type text um, with these triangles, circles, crosses, and also some sophisticated use of typography. You can see in the photographs that have been used most effectively that the photographs are composed, and that's what you choose to put within the photograph. We'll come to composition shortly um, in a way that leaves a lot of space, which allows for the design elements to be dropped on top of the photograph. This one is very much um, a graphics based one, but you can see there are, is a use of the students' photographs and there's this um, grainy effect on the photographs, which is effective. The text is deconstructed. What I mean by that, if you look at the image in the top right, that's a particularly effective example. You can't necessarily read all the letters properly. They're chopped up a little bit. This um, draws you in, it makes it less easy to read on your first viewing, so you have to pay a little bit more attention to the information, to the detail, to be able to understand what the poster is for. This one is obviously very graphics led, um, it has strong use of vectors, it also has effective use of colour. Um, the photographs are chopped up and deconstructed in this case, so it has that collage feel to it. The student has very effectively used space, so the way the images are positioned with a lot of background gives um, a little bit more um, emphasis to the images. Space is your friend. Use space effectively. Do not feel like you need to fill the whole image. And again, this one uses space especially effectively and it uses strong compositional techniques. We're going to look at some compositional techniques when you're taking your photograph, but composition in short means how you position things on your canvas on your page within the frame of your photograph. So that's what you're leading towards. To start off we're going to look at two photographers and they're going to influence how you take your own photographs. You're going to do some photos around the college campus and then you're going to learn to realize which are the best photographs in terms of their composition, in terms of being a photograph in their own right, but also which photographs can be more effectively used in the design process. You're going to look at some editing of photographs. You're going to look at some Photoshop basics, and that is going to show you how to develop your ideas 
and also to make your photographs look more effective. Traditionally, we did a Manchester trip that is potentially on hold at the moment due to the current COVID situation. We will keep you posted on that. But of course, it will be interesting to take photographs in other locations other than the college. Um, the, the exhibition is at Home Gallery. It's a, a fake exhibition, but you're making posters for an exhibition at Home Gallery about architecture in Manchester. So if you can go into Manchester and take photographs, that will be good. But we can work on finding some other locations. You will find that there's lots of interesting architecture around you that you don't necessarily see. So start looking up, start looking around and seeing what buildings look like, what is in your town and city. You'll do some basic drawing. There won't be loads of drawing, but there'll be a little bit. Um, drawing is vital to any architect. Um, it's a way of imagining what a space looks like, of understanding a three-dimensional space. So we will look at some basic drawing work. We're also going to look at two graphic designers. David Carson is one of the most famous designers in the world. He uses typography. You looked at a design earlier that had deconstructed typogra typography. That's something that Carson does extensively. We'll also look at a collage-based artist called Molokid. And once you see Molokid's work, you will see that a lot of the, de the designs we've just looked at do take a strong influence from Molokid. And then you will develop a more personal project, so you will be encouraged to find some designers and photographers that you like and bring your own ideas into the project to make some unique work. So as I said, we traditionally went to Manchester to do some photographs and drawings. Obviously, if you choose to go into Manchester, you must observe um, COVID guidelines and remain safe, but it would be useful to take some photographs in other locations other than round college campus. Obviously it's not ideal for us to take a huge group into Manchester at the moment so that trip is on hold. It may or may not happen at a later date. So here are some examples of photographs that were taken on the Manchester trip. You can see these are particularly effective. Um, the composition, so the positioning of the buildings within the frame of the, the photograph is very strong. They're taken from a very low vantage point. Um, there's a lot of detail in the foreground um, where, the, where the photo is focused. So very strong examples of the sorts of things you could be looking at. You'll notice that the light is very strong. Um, it is always useful to take photographs on a sunny day. And here's some others. You can also see this example of um, ensuring that you leave some space. So you could see, particularly in the right-hand image, how you could add typography and vector-based work on top of this photograph to make an effective design because of the space left where the sky is. So we're going to look at some photographic techniques now. These are photos from around college. Um, you can see there's a mix of black and white and colour. This one, black and white. Black and white, in my opinion, helps um, you to develop a stronger use of contrast. So you can see in this photo there's some areas that are almost completely black and some areas that are completely white and then a series of tones within that. So I think that's a um, quite effective technique and you will have noticed that a lot of the designs we looked at earlier in the presentation use this use of high contrast. So here's an image um, from around college, a lot of space on this one. This is an attempt to a couple of photographic techniques. So you can see on this image that there are two intersecting lines vertically and two horizontally and that creates what we call thirds. So you can see that it's separated into thirds diagonally, um, sorry, vertically and horizontally and it creates these points of interest in the middle. Um, so where the lines intersect are supposedly areas that you should be aiming to put points of interest within your photograph on. The golden section or golden ratio is a composition guide which we'll look at in more detail later in the course. Some people call it the Fibonacci spiral or the golden spiral so you might have heard of that before. It helps lead the viewer through the entire photograph and the composition is supposedly more pleasing and balanced for your human eye if you use the golden section effectively. Um, a lot of people confuse the golden section and the rule of thirds. They have a lot of similarities. As a rule, the, um, the rule of thirds is best used for quite minimal scenarios. So such as this, it might have been quite nice to line the edge of the buildings up to that line 
Um, but this is quite an effective photo in its own right. This photograph uses a lot of very effective um, compositional techniques. So you can see there's a strong use of corners. The angle you take the photograph from helps create those corners. So use of corners is a technique that is used by uh, photographers to compose exciting and dynamic images. The leading lines, so those are the lines that shoot across the page. One of them is documented by seeing that, um, that dotted line that goes across the image. That is a leading line. It draws you through the image. It creates what we call a bit of a rhythm through the image. Um, both, of the use, both the use of corners and the leading lines are helped by this low vantage point. So getting right down below the building helps um, exaggerate the height and the steepness of the building, but it also helps the photographer to get these dynamic photographic techniques, the corners, the leading lines. And of course, with it being black and white, it has this use of high contrast as well, which makes it a particularly effective image. Again, we see a strong use of a low vantage point on this photograph. This image perhaps shows you the rule of thirds a little bit more effectively because you can see where the white crosses are. Those are the, the, way, the places where the lines intersect. And you can see this photograph has attempted to have points of interest within the photograph on these little white X's. There's again a strong use of low vantage point. And I think this works effectively because you've got the, the detail of the, the um, fence, the gate in the foreground and then you've got the different materials of the building behind it. There's a lot going on when you look closely at this image. There's brickwork, there's more contemporary design on the right hand side, and of course there's the foreground interest with the um, fence. Okay, some other examples of low vantage point, these leading lines, this, this strong use of diagonals, and also the idea of leaving a bit of space around the image. You don't have to fill the frame all the time, although on occasions you might choose to. This one has effective use of foreground interest, so you'll notice that some of it is focused and some of it is a little bit more blurry, and that really exaggerates the texture of the building. And again, the position of the buildings, the dynamic use of corners, um, the flatness of this, I think, is quite effective, and this is a good response to some of the photography work we're about to look at. And again, we have these dynamic diagonal lines on the right-hand side that lead you through the image, but also on the left, we've got some strong use of corners, but also attention to detail. Um, obviously, phot uh, photographic and compositional techniques are important, but so is the subject matter. You need to photograph something that is interesting to create an interesting photograph. So we're going to look at two photographers, Binet and Hervé, and we're going to take influence from their work when we take our own photographs. So Helen Binet is um, a photographer um, who concentrates on architectural photography, and there's some examples of her work in the coming slides. Um, Here's a quote from Daniel Lieberskind, who actually designed the Imperial War Museum that we looked at on the Manchester trip and you could see in some of the early photographs. And he also designed the Jewish Museum, which you'll see in a couple of slides time. So Daniel Lieberskind is an architect and Helen Binet photographed his work. And he said, Binet has emerged as one of the leading architectural photographers in the world. Every time Binet takes a photograph, she exposes architecture's achievements, strength, pathos and fragility. Binet is a Swiss-French architectural photographer, and she's actually based in London now, and she's widely considered as one of the leading photographers of architecture in the world. So she's photographed the work of Daniel Lieberskind, but also uh, architects such as Zaha Hadid, who you might have heard of. She famously designed the Olympic swimming pool in London, which you might have seen, and we will look at her architectural work later in the course. Binet has photographed both contemporary and historical architecture, so very new buildings, but also stuff of interest from the past. And importantly, she is very much an advocate of analog photography, so she works with film rather than digital photography. She's very interested in the idea of how light comes through the building. This creates texture, but you can see the dynamic diagonals that she's got there, those leading lines, but also this high use of contrast very dark areas and very light areas created by 
the way the light comes through the building and the way she's set up and composed the photograph. And this is the Jewish Museum, which was designed by Daniel Liebeskind. So if you could ever visit this, um, Berlin is a great place to visit. And this particular building is a really thought provoking um, building in terms of its content, but also an incredible piece of architecture. So you can see that the use of contrast is really strong in here because of the way the light comes into the building. It creates a lot of texture with the concrete that the building is made out of, but it's got those strong diagonal lines. Lucien Hervé um, is widely considered to be one of the great architectural uh, photographers of the 20th century. Um, here is a quote about his work, which perhaps gives it a little bit more context. Hervé approached his subject seeking not only to document the buildings he was commissioned to photograph, but also, especially, to convey a sense of space, texture and structure. One of the most important things about architecture is being able to imagine a three-dimensional space. So an architect must look at a space and imagine how a building will fit into that space. And if someone who wants to document architecture through photography, such as Hervé, needs to also have those um, skills when it comes to understanding space, understanding three dimensions, even though ultimately the photographer makes something that is two-dimensional. I think Hervé captures strong contrast very well. So the light and shadow is very effective. He also very carefully places emphasis on the details of the building. Um, so he can communicate the depth of a room or the surface of a wall or even the strength of a building's framework. But he also uses a lot of similar compositional techniques to Binet. So you've got these diagonal lines, you've got these strong uses of corners. And then obviously on this image on the right hand side, you've got the texture as well in the foreground. I find this photo particularly interesting um, because I wouldn't say this building is something you would necessarily particularly look at and say is a beautiful building, although I really like it aesthetically myself. So you could consider this a quite brutalist piece of work. It's very solid, concrete harsh edges, dark textures, but I think this photograph is stunning. Um, the use of corners, the use of diagonals, the contrast within it, um, but very importantly the texture, the way the building's um, shown to have these interesting textures. I think um, it's very exciting in the way it's composed. The angle that um, Hervé has chosen to take the photograph from obviously helps create all these dynamic angles. And again, strong, strong use of contrast, diagonals. On the image on the right hand side, you can see that we've put these dotted lines on. When you make a critical link to a photographer, we like the idea that you document exactly what techniques have been used by the photographer. And one way of doing it is to drop their image onto your pages document and to put these lines on. So that's something you'll be asked to do shortly. The previous image had um, a low vantage point. You can also get the opposite, a high vantage point. So this is quite interesting as it's taken from above. Okay, so there's some exciting photography work from two very well established photographers who you should learn more about. You're now going to start preparing to make a critical link to these two photographers. So this is an example of a critical link. On the right hand side, you can see everything you need in the link. So because they work with black and white photography, it is probably best that your images are black and white. You need a title so anyone can see who the work is about. You need examples of their work. The diagrams are these dotted lines that explain the photographic techniques and they're um, composed alongside keywords. So the keywords explain what the diagrams are showing. And then some quotes are always useful. So we want you to make a double page spread on pages. So one side will be about Binet and one side will be about Hervé. In preparation for making that link, this is what we want you to do now. So we want you to collect some information about the two photographers, around 100 words. I'm much more concerned with knowing 
why their work looks like it does than I am with knowing their history. So try and concentrate your research on what techniques they're using and why. Quotes are always useful. You might find quotes that the two photographers have said themselves or you might find people talking about their work as Daniel Lieberskin did. You will have noticed the quote I used early in the presentation. And I want you to collect eight images. You some of those images might be used as background images, but obviously some of the images will be used in the foreground and you would drop your diagrams over the top to explain the photographic techniques and compositional techniques that the two photographers have used. So that is your work for today. If you could collect the information on this screen at the moment and make sure you've got it ready for when we make the critical links.